Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this opening session of the Gathering 2023 um, on partnership prizes and pitfalls. I hope you've all had your <coughs> coffees and are ready for an interesting discussion about that thorny topic of partnership work between the third sector and the public, private and academic sectors. Um, my name is Susan Smith. I'm Head of Communications at Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland, and I'm just here to facilitate this discussion with um, our great panel of speakers and yourselves. Um, our panel represents a range of voluntary organisations and Edinburgh City Council uh, who have experience of quite a different range of partnership work. So they've got lots of different perspect perspectives to present to you this morning. I think all the partnerships that people are going to speak about today are really positive. But because of the experience on the panel, I think they'll have lots of advice on how to avoid pitfalls and some of the common challenges that occur in setting up and developing good partnership work between the third sector and other sectors. So I'm just going to introduce the panel and then they'll speak for a few minutes. I'll follow up with some questions and then there'll be an opportunity for you guys also to ask some questions. So first up, we have Anna Cowan, who's Policy and Campaigns Manager at Waverley Care. Jane Claire Judson, who's Chief Executive of Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland, and Gavin Sharp and Paul Wilson are here from Edinburgh Volunteer Centre and Edinburgh City Council to talk about their partnership um, supporting Ukrainian refugees. So, should we start off with Anna? Do you want to tell us a little bit about Fast Track yep, Cities? Of course. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Fab. So I am Anna Cowan and I work for Waverly Care. We're Scotland's leading HIV and Hepatitis C charity. And our partnership is um, to do with an international initiative called Fast Track Cities, which doesn't sound very clear what it is. Um, but it's a global initiative where cities around the world sign up to commit to reaching certain HIV targets with the eventual goal of ending new transmissions of HIV by 2030, as well as zero HIV stigma. So in Scotland, um, there was some work ongoing pre-pandemic with Fast Track Cities, but we took over last year. And the cities that have signed up in Scotland are Glasgow, Aberdeen, Dundee, Perth and Edinburgh. And within each city, um, it's made up of various stakeholders from the NHS, local council, health and social care partnership, third sector, as well as people living with HIV. And we meet several times a year. Uh, we actually had our last meeting yesterday um, to discuss best practice and um, innovative ideas on how to reduce HIV transmissions. And we also have a community panel, which is made up of people living with HIV across Scotland to make sure that they really set the agenda and um, tell us about the kind of biggest priorities and issues the community is facing and how we can really make sure that they're represented kind of in the, in the international stage. So that's a very brief overview. Well, thanks very much, Anna. Um, Jane Clare, do you want to follow up? You've, I think you want to talk about a few different partnerships that Chess Heart and Stroke Scotland are involved with. Yes, I'll just touch on a couple of them. Um, as an organisation, we work um, from a statutory basis with the NHS through service level agreements, which as you can imagine is at one end of our partnership um, sort of spectrum. But of course, we run the gamut through volunteering and retail and fundraising to create partnerships that are both corporate and public sector and third sector. So there's a range of different things that we do. And I'm sure we'll touch on all the different sort of examples and, and tensions that there can be across them. Just to mention one um, is our project with NHS Lothian and Pogo Digital to create the long COVID care pathway. Um, it's a project that involves the public sector through NHS Lothian Board and the private sector through Pogo Digital and then ourselves as a third sector. So you can imagine the challenges that are there in working together, but also just the amazing positivity that you get through working through three different partners. The expertise, you know, the, the intel that you can get from each other, the challenge that you get from one another to bring that together. And I guess what I would say about partnerships is that quite often they fill a gap. Um, where others haven't stepped in. So um, certainly from the long COVID perspective, as you'll recall, no, no one in this room needs to be told, I think that long COVID is a really challenging condition that we didn't know anything about um, in March 2020. And to create a partnership between three different partners to address that with very little evidence base to go on required a lot of trust and confidence in one another to take that forward and then to deliver that for people who are experiencing long COVID. So it's been a really interesting journey for us to create that project and take it forward. There's been the ups and downs of the NHS pressures, pressures in the third sector itself, you know, the things that we face on a daily basis. And then of course, working with an entrepreneurial startup in terms of Pogo Digital. Um, and that's tested everything from governance to making sure the patient voice is heard, um, to making sure that we're evidence-basing what it is that we do so that we can prove that our model works. 
And that sort of partnership working is both absolutely fantastic and exciting, but also at times a bit of a hard graft. Um, but if there's something we know about in the third sector, it's hard graft. <laughs> Thanks, Jane Claire. Paul and Gavin, um, do you want to follow up telling us a little bit about the Re Ukrainian refugee project? Sure, yeah. yeah. I should actually say, talking of partnerships, I am the Chief Officer of Volunteer Edinburgh, and in Edinburgh, your third sector interface is a partnership <coughs> um, of, with EVOC and Edinburgh Social Enterprise Network. Did you see my mind go blank there for a second? <laughs> uh, I'll get in trouble later on. Uh, but actually, what Gavin and I are doing today, we were talking about partnership, which is really around Edinburgh's response to the Ukrainian crisis, the war in Ukraine, the legal war in Ukraine that Russia started, and the influx of displaced Ukrainians to, to the UK, to Scotland, and to Edinburgh in particular. Um, our partnership is really wide. It includes it's all sectors. It's not just the third sector, and many third sector partners were involved in this work, but also the private sector and the statutory sector. Uh, so I think, you know, when we're talking about partnership, we'll maybe touch on some of the people that we've worked with. And it, it, I think that's been the incredible, the incredible strength and the, the, what's made our ability to respond to that crisis in Edinburgh so effective. And Gavin, do you want to? Yeah, no, I think, um, thanks, Paul, and good morning all. Yeah, I think February 22 last year, so my role in the council up until then was resilience specialist. So part of my day-to-day -day job was working with partners across the city responding to incidents, events, um, weather events, uh, and, and everything in between. So um, in February last year, I was asked to lead the, the Edinburgh response to, to what was happening in Ukraine. I don't know if some of you will know, some of you won't know, but Edinburgh's twinned with Kyiv as well. So initially, we were looking at the, the civic and aid response, and this was prior to any of the visa schemes being opened up. Um, Someone sitting in the audience, Hannah, is the chair of AUGB, and, and very quickly, again, another organisation brought together a group, initially about five or six of us, just to discuss what may or may not happen. But very quickly, the, the partnership that Paul and myself are going to talk about actually includes about 30 different organisations across the city. And that also includes working closely with Scottish and UK governments, UK Border Force, Police Scotland, Edinburgh Airport, Network Rail. So it's really quite a broad perspective. And then in June last year, another partner joined us, which was one that none of us had expected, yes. um, but a, a shipping agent as well. Um, some of you will be aware about the, the MS Victoria was there. So, and, and it's shipping agent who's based in Miami, again, came, came into, the, into the mix, um, which none of us were expecting. Um, but actually, the, the partnership work and learning from a, a, almost a different world in America and how they do things, it actually benefited the, the response. So we'll touch on, touch on various things, but lots of positives. For me, the biggest thing this is built on trust has been from day one. Um, the partnership continues to meet. We were meeting daily. We moved to weekly. We're now every couple of weeks, but that partnership and it is still there, still strong. Um, but really built on trust. So looking forward to hearing some of the questions. Great, thank you very much. So I think it, it's obviously clear that partnerships are all about relationships. And um, in the third sector, we're all very good at networking and um, building relationships with, with people, but often turning those relationships into something concrete, something more than wor warm words, is really challenging. So I wondered if you wanted to give us a bit of an example about how the partnership that you've been working on became became something concrete rather than just a lot of people sitting around saying oh yeah this is really important we should do something about it uh paul um yeah <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i i would reflect i mean i think i've, I've said this to gav before and others i don't think uh, the partnership that dealt with the ukraine crisis in edinburgh would have come together so naturally if it hadn't been for what came before it so um Obviously, it's all about connections, isn't it? It's all about people that you, you might have worked with in the past. But I think if we hadn't had to work uh, with our statutory partners so closely during the pandemic, during the COVID crisis, we might not have had that same just roll our sleeves up and get on with it uh, attitude that we did have. I think it was the speed in which Gavin was able to set up that team. I mean, Gavin talked about being in resilience. And yes, so Gavin and I had known each other a couple of years working because we were both on the, uh, the Operation Unicorn um, a working group for a number of years, but we never actually met, I don't think. And then all of a sudden, you've got all these people. And as I say, Gavin <coughs> reflecting, I think is quite interesting. 
I think one of the things about partnerships, sometimes if you have got those interpersonal relationships and you bring new people into the mix, that can be quite difficult. But in actual fact, in our wide, you know, 30-odd organisation partnership, it wasn't. When Landry Kung came on and, uh, as I mentioned, when the boats arrived, they just fit hand in glove and we all, we all got on with it. So, yeah, the relationships are vital. Yeah, and how do you think you've managed that, Gavin? How have you managed for those people <laughs> to genius. slot right in? And I think um, a lot of it was built on what we'd done previously in the resilience world. So within Scottish Government SCORE, there's a resilience partnership set up. So it was basically replicating that. So within that, we have data sharing agreements. We've got various other communication channels, comms groups. Um, knowing the right people to phone at the right time and luckily then picking up the phone. There, there was a bit of luck in it. There's, there's absolutely no, no denying it. Um, I think not having egos within it, I think bringing new people into the group is difficult. I know many other local authorities still struggle across sector. It's a natural, it, it, it's not progression. It's not as quick progression. We, we've had to do it. Others are a little bit behind still. They, they're trying to learn from us. We were really at the forefront of the cross-sector partnership. Um, we had lots of other local authorities sit in on our meetings at the start. Interestingly, it was self John's in the crowd. We were invited to speak to a group of French uh, chief executives at the city chambers about cross-partnership working. In France, cross-partnership working is unheard of. Uh, I think they were quite clear that they couldn't understand how, as a local authority, I was comfortable with allowing decisions to be made by people out with the local authority and the administration. And what we were trying to explain to them was, well, it, it is really a team Edinburgh ethos. There's a lot of trust, there's a lot of belief. We've worked together a long time. Um, everyone's got a voice. So it was really interesting having those conversations and trying to say, we don't know everything. I mean, I don't know who's all from Edinburgh, but the council, it, it can get a bashing at times as well. But um, I'll be first to put my hands up. I, there is absolutely no way we could have responded um, just through a council response. It would have been impossible. We don't have the knowledge. We don't have the understanding. It's, it's utilising our partners' key skills. Um, their, their partners' partners as well. We've got people that I had never met that Paul's known for years and vice versa. And it's just trying to fit that together. It's not always easy chairing the meetings. There is a lot of voices. I think we've done okay <laughs> so far. Um, but yeah, it's just a, it's allowing people to have that voice and making sure that they, they understand that in, in this response, it had never been done. There'd never been something like this practically since World War II. Um, we've never seen movement of people um, across, the, across the continent that quickly. So we're, we're still learning. There's no silly questions in any of the meetings. It's really an open forum. Um, but also at the back of that, we've still got to keep that governance structure, which we've sort of replicated from the resilience world. There will be audits, there will be an inquiry. So we've just got to make sure everything, everyone's comfortable with that. So, so it sounds like um, in the sort of emergency response resilience world, there are quite a lot of structures in place um, already to develop these sorts of partnerships, which obviously COVID um, and the response to COVID um, helped to develop even further. Um, it's sort of a, a sort of common thread amongst the third sector that partnership work improved during COVID. But I do wonder whether it improved in that sort of situation more than it did in other situations. Jane Clear, are, is it your experience that COVID has made it easier to develop new partnerships? I think it's a yes and no answer. Um, and I think there were some instances where things moved a lot faster. Um, certainly, uh, I think the Scottish Government and local authorities uh, recognised that the third sector was essential to that response um, and how it is that we could mobilise extremely quickly. Um, and I'm certainly very proud that as an organisation, our kindness volunteering programme was up and running within days and recruiting thousands of volunteers. You know, our, our ability to respond in the third sector, we don't have the same strictures on us as local authorities and Scottish Government do, so we could, we could shift very fast. Um, and in those circumstances, I think, yes, I think where we could see a kind of overriding crisis point, that, that can often shift things very, very quickly. I think that what I would say, though, is that there's other areas where that is, has not been the case and that COVID didn't particularly help. Um, and I, I'll give a couple examples. In terms of our long COVID work, um, and I'm sure that, you know, it, it's been uh, discussed in the Scottish Parliament through the long COVID inquiry that was held by the Health Committee, that there were issues about partnership working there. 
about the, the sense that there wasn't a common ground um, a, a, of tackling this new condition that was emerging. And so it was quite interesting to go for a meeting with a group of civil servants where we were absolutely on side, absolutely in agreement, pushing things forward. And then later on that day, go into a separate meeting where they were saying that this is not a priority right now and, and we're, we're not keen to work in partnership with you. Um, and, and Hamza Youssef uh, has, has acknowledged that as part of the inquiry that they didn't do as well on that side of things. I think part of the challenge is that we have different cultures across the public sector and across the third sector, we have to recognise that ourselves, um, and within Scottish Government. So that means that it's, it's not necessarily going to replicate because you've had a fantastic partnership here that that will mm -hmm. happen over here. And anybody who works with health boards will know that. 14 health boards are not the same. And even within health boards, you know, we deal with four conditions and we can do, be doing great on stroke. And then the minute you talk about cardiac, it's, it's a completely different set of circumstances. So I think it's a yes and no answer. And I think some of the lessons have been learned, but in other areas, I don't think they have. And I think that's why sometimes the third sector feels slightly aggrieved, you know, that, well, we did this amazing stuff here, so why could we not take that further? Um, I don't think it's our responsibility to resolve that, but I do think that we're probably the most positive actors in that conversation to push those things forward. And we've got the skill and expertise and insight to take people on that journey. Um, but that, that does put a, a burden of responsibility on us. Um, and at times that, that could be challenging, I think, for us to take on board. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Anna, you were saying that you came into your partnership, you weren't there from the start, so you weren't instrumental in developing those relationships. Mm. What, how, how did that impact on the way the partnership has played out and how the sort of challenges, has it been plain sailing or has it been a bit more tricky coming in later? I think it was useful in the sense that, you know, the foundations of the partnership were there. Um, there were relationships in health board areas that we don't work in. We are a national organisation, but we don't work in, particularly in areas such as NHS Tayside. Um, so it was great that those organisations um, were already connected with Fast Track Cities, but I think there were some feelings that this work had been imposed on them rather than this being a partnership. It was us coming in and saying, you should sign up to this great initiative. Um, and to them, it felt like we were just giving more work um, without kind of highlighting the benefits of the, the partnership. But once the cities were signed up, we had a kind of grand um, signing events uh, last year. Um, city leaders signed up, um, council leaders, leaders of the NHS boards. Um, I think the benefits have been seen there, but I think a challenge we've had is for a lot of the kind of, for example, uh, council leaders, the signing has been like the one and done, like they've been involved and that's it. They've not viewed it as that, as the beginning of the partnership, um, that this isn't just a kind of, you know, press release uh, image that's going out and then that's it. It's, it's actually a continued relationship. So we have struggled to kind of maintain some of those um, key actors in this, but then we've also found other great uh, relationships through other uh, members of the organisations, for example, um, in a lot of the councils, you know, many councillors have never worked on an issue like HIV before. And I think there was some hesitancy just because it's, you know, a condition that's shrouded in a lot of stigma and a lot of misinformation. And we had to make sure that every single member of the partnership was fully kind of educated about HIV and really understood the nuances, complexities of the condition. Um, but I do think that it was beneficial, um, you know, that we jumped in um, because the relationships were already there. There was that foundation. So it's worked out really well. And um, kind of a year on from all of those signing events, we've built these really fantastic relationships with people who we wouldn't ordinarily work with, which I think is really nice. So. And, and how have you um, addressed challenges in process between the different partners? Because we're working with a lot of different partners who will have different IT systems, may not have data sharing agreements, um, have different, you know, whether they're using Teams or Zooms, mm -hmm. have just different ways of working and different processes. How, how do you overcome that? Mm, well, it is tricky. You know, you, you come into a city and you don't know what the relationship between the mm. NHS and the council is. You know, you don't know what conflicts there could be and um, what issues there might be. So it's been tricky for us to jump in there and be like, hello, this is this great initiative. Uh, everyone work together and be nice. Um, but at the same time, you know, especially for, for example, councillors who've never worked on HIV, we're, really, we're the experts. And it's an issue people are really interested in. People remember the tombstone of the 90s of all the stigma that existed and are really surprised to hear how far we've come. And we're now at a point where we're getting to zero new transmissions of HIV. And that's so incredible. Um, so I, I think, you know, that overarching thing has really uh, been able to uh, bring everyone together regardless. Yeah. yeah. And Jane Claire, do you think then that focus on mission and the, the vision can overcome the process 
challenges that um, exist when you're developing relationships and partnerships? Yeah, I mean, it can. Uh, I think what I would say is it, it's quite interesting at times in a partnership when you're setting it up that um, sometimes I think the strategy sector are surprised that we will stick to our mission and that we will say this is what we're aiming to do and we're willing to work in partnership but we're not willing to take on all of those other monkeys at the same time that you might be dealing with because this is our monkey and uh, this, is the, this is the issue that we want to solve. And as a charity, I think we've taken quite a strong stance on that, that um, we, are, uh, we, we are very privileged, I think, to be able to put the patient voice in the center. Um, and quite often for clinicians, that's challenging because it will challenge what it is that they've learned over time. It will mm. challenge what they see from their clinical perspective. Um, but we've stuck to that mission. We've said, no, that, that is our job in that room, is to say that you understand the clinical pathway, but this person is telling you how it feels and how it means in their real life, in their everyday life. Um, so we do stick really strongly to that, and, and we're very upfront about our values. So we say that we're agile, and we're innovative, and we're inclusive, and we're courageous, and those things. And we talk about those things with our partners. You know, if you're not agile, that's gonna be a problem. You know, and we can help you with that, and we understand it, but we're not going to sacrifice the values that our people tell us are important to them. Um, you know, we engage uh, with our stakeholders who tell us what they want us to do, and then, and then we take that mission forward. Sometimes I think that what that can do is remind our partners of what their mission is, because we talk about it so strongly, and then they go, oh, actually, you know, I, I didn't get into this game <laughs> to do lots of report writing and do all these processes, or I want, I want my patients to be well, and I can give you a common ground there. Um, I think that where we do find challenges is that we care about governance and processes just as much as our partners do. And sometimes I think that's not always recognised. So the NHS stresses about patient data and about sharing that data and about sharing their systems. Well, we stress about that too, because we have a clinical governance responsibility in the charity, um, as well as a duty of care to our people. So we can find common ground over that. Uh, but sometimes that equality isn't there in terms of thinking, well, the, the, you know, the NHS, this is ours. Well, no, it's the person's. It's the person who's going through this particular clinical pathway. What I will say is that, um, and it's a message that, that we take um, to government and the NHS all the time, is that it can take 18 to 20 months from, uh, from going from a conversation with a health board to actually seeing someone with one of our conditions when you set up a partnership. That's too long. It's too long for them and it's too long for us. And quite often that is about the processes. So NHS systems and databases not speaking to one another internally and then not talking to us. It's a key issue for us is referral pathways. You know, if we can't get that, and you know, <laughs> you'll understand this inside out. If we can't get that bit right, then neither partner is working well with each other mm -hmm. um, to share that information to support the person at the centre. And the discussions that we're having with the, the Minister for Public Health at the moment is how, how do we create that Once for Scotland approach um, to that uh, issue? I mean, it costs me a lot of money as a charity. I could put two or three staff on full time to deal with those governance issues around databases and processes. How do we get to a stage where that procurement process with the third sector, you create it with one health board, why do I have to go through it four times in each health board for each of our conditions? So I guess a bit of an ask from this audience is, you know, we would like to solve that. It's maybe not the most sexy, exciting issue <laughs> happening at, at the gathering uh, over the next two days, but for us, it's totally critical to the mission of what we're trying to do in working in partnership. And if anybody's interested in joining us in that call and working with the minister to say, how do we get that commissioning piece resolved? so that we can get those things underway, then, then I'd be really interested to hear from you and to, to take that forward. In the spirit of partnership. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, hopefully when we open it up to the audience, some people might respond to that. Um, Gavin and, and, and Paul, I feel like you do seem to have quite a good structure in your partnership. And you, you, Gavin, you mentioned that there was data sharing agreements do you, in place. Do you think that's something that could be replicated in other areas? Um, and how did you do that? Yeah, it should be, um, <laughs> and has been. I think, as I say, the, the, the governance around it is really replicating um, the, the Scottish Government resilience model. That model can be replicated across any response, cross-sector organisations. That's what it's set up to do. It's not really been done. It was touched on at COVID, but working through COVID as well with NHS colleagues and partnerships as well, the data sharing was very difficult at times, especially at the, at the start of the pandemic. Um, th there was a lot, a lot of nuances around that. Th this has been set up to do exactly that. When we looked at what could happen in Edinburgh from February 22 till now, there was a few events that you really hoped wouldn't happen. Death of the Queen, Operation Unicorn. The data sharing that, it was basically replicating what we'd done. Now, 
we, we'd all been working on Operation Unicorn for 10 years. However, everyone knew the day it happened, the, the situation around what was happening in the city at the time, weather forecasts, how many people would come, how's the pandemic, ev everything would determine the response. We actually replicated what we'd done for the Ukraine response in part for that. So we had a core partnership round the table for planning. Within about an hour and a half of the announcement, there was at least four or five other partners that had never been part of the planning for Operation Unicorn that were brought in, including Event Scotland, to, to work on that. And again, it was looking at working with Paul and volunteers and the, the volunteering network and third sector network about how we respond as a city. And again, because we had certain governance structures set up previously for, for what we're currently doing, um, it was quite easy. There was a lot of chat with our GDPR team and, and various other things and Scottish government and, and UK government as well. But actually, it can be replicated. It takes a bit of work, but it should, it can be done. Um, and we've proved it twice uh, over the last sort of 24 months. And I think, and I'm happy to talk to, to people off table or, or drop me an email um, and work with the team that we're working with and along with Scottish government um, to, to talk through how that can be done. Because I say, I know not everywhere in the country they're quite comfortable with it. You mentioned GDPR and everyone was, oh, <laughs> um, it's not a scary process as it sounds. There is ways around it. Um, so yeah, happy, happy to chat through if, if people want to do that. I'm happy to work with, with you guys as well, just to, to explain in a bit more in depth how we've, we've got around some of those. Yeah. yeah. And there you go, partnership developing in action. <laughs> um, Paul, is your experience working with Gavin different from um, other experiences you've had throughout your career, developing partnerships and overcoming these kind of processes? Yeah, I, I would say it is. And again, I would go back to that whole thing that we had to learn very fast during the pandemic. That you could, there, was, there was very little room for people being interesting. You know, we had a crisis we needed to solve. And so Ukraine was the same. One of the things I would reflect on the Ukraine Response Partnership Working Group has been the pragmatism, particularly in the immediate phase, you know, March, April, um, 22, where you're actually in a humanitarian response at that point, because the people who were arriving, you know, who my volunteers were meeting at Edinburgh Airport, were literally arriving with nothing. Now that has changed, but these were people who were fleeing Mariupol, places that, that we all heard on the news at that time. It's very different. So, you know, the, the hub was set up, and again, there you go. You've got this big crisis, you need this place. The public sector, the private sector at Bingham Harden steps up, and Gav is able to work with Nat West to create the hub. My getting, th you know, some of these barriers that we I sometimes think we do artificially put them in place. <coughs> we get really uptight about stuff, and that gets in the way of us doing things, and I've got very little patience for that. So I reflect the, the real pragmatism between border, UK Borders Force, and my volunteers at the airport completely working hand in glove, you know? And I wouldn't have actually believed that would have happened quite so easily, but it did. You know, I could have expected a hundred different reasons why um, Borders Force might not trust these volunteers that are here from, from my organization, but they do, and the partnership was really strong. And I think, I think that, that bit of pra the pragmatism went through the whole process, and that's what enabled us to work so efficiently, I believe. Great. So it's 10 o'clock, so I thought we could open it up for a few questions from the audience. There are a couple of microphones at either side, so you're welcome to come down and stand in front of a microphone. Or, or Carson, are, are you volunteering to...? <laughs> um, or you can just stand up and, and shout, <laughs> uh, whatever suits you. Um, do we have any questions? There we are, up at the back. The microphone's just here if you need it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is about evaluation. I wondered how you managed um, partners all being involved in evaluation or whether one partner took the lead for the whole partnership in terms of evaluation and what some of the challenges and advice you have for that. <laughs> Good question. And have you got anything to, to... Yeah, it's, it's, that's been a really interesting <coughs> one for us because, um, you know, we've almost been that organisation that has got everyone together and signed everybody up and it's almost like we've been the leaders 
but it is a partnership, so it's not, we've been trying to work out what our role is within that, um, you know, whether each city is responsible for evaluation, you know, the work that's going on there, or if it's ours. Um, and I think that's honestly something we're still trying to work out and trying to suss out um, who we are among fast track cities. Um, but at the moment, it has been us, and you know, we've been chairing meetings, we've been um, catching up with every city, seeing what work is going on. Um, so at the moment, it has been us, we've been responsible for evaluation, but I think we are still trying to work out um, if that is the best fit for it. Um, because you know, every city around the world who works on fast track cities does it very differently. And we've taken quite a unique approach in Scotland because we are joining up every city in Scotland, working nationally. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a work in progress, but at the moment it is us leading on it. Uh, Jane Clare, do you, is that, is, do you feel that replicates your experience? Is it often the third sector um, who ends up having to take on the responsibility for evaluation? I mean, I, I think it depends on what the partnership is. It's, it's a brilliant question, because I think that evaluation is probably one of the most hardest mm -hmm. issues that we have to deal with as a sector. So how do we prove that what we're doing um, is having any impact whatsoever. And it's a challenge that's made to us, whether we receive direct government funding, whether it's through partnership working, you know, are you doing what you said you would do? And can you prove that it's having, making a difference in someone's life? Um, I've got a couple of thoughts around it. The first one is, is that quite often there's competing priorities over evaluation. So from my perspective, it's about the patient experience. Does that per person feel confident and held and, and as though they've had a chance to talk through what really matters to them? Whereas from the NHS perspective, it's did we manage to get this clinical objective achieved? And so evaluation is quite often a negotiation at the partnership stage, you know, that setting up of a partnership about what, you're, you know, what each partner is wanting out of it um, and then trying to negotiate that. When we do service level agreements, quite often that is set by clinical governance frameworks rather than anything else because that's, you know, we're trying to deliver a service on behalf of the NHS. So that, that discussion can, can be quite different to thinking about, for example, inputting into a Scottish government process around the Stroke Improvement Plan, where we'd be looking for a completely different partnership and, and level of evaluation. What I would say, and it's maybe a controversial thing to say, I think the third sector is often held to a higher standard than the public and private sector. Um, and the things that I am asked to produce on behalf of my charity are things that the NHS, with all of its resource and data, cannot produce. Um, and so sometimes I do find that a bit of a challenge, but it's like, well, can you produce a data set giving us X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, well, you can't. So <laughs> like, what, you know, how do you expect me to do that? Um, now that can be a challenging thing to push back onto your partner. I think the thing to do there is, obviously I could be the chippy person going, well, if you can, you do it, why are you asking me to do it? And sometimes I feel that way, <laughs> but partnership work is always about finding the common ground. So then it's saying, well, actually we both want to know that but we're gonna struggle and you're gonna struggle. So how do we come to a conclusion about that together? And certainly the work that we've done in the stroke care audit um, in Scotland um, and also the heart audit in Scotland, that's kind of a bit behind the stroke care audit and looking at that data and starting to build the patient experience into that. And then we can start to get the evaluation for both sides of that partnership um, working. Um, I think there's some great work in the third sector around evaluation and impact, but I, I do think that it's one of those things that we're challenged with that, that other partners um, aren't held to the same standard. And I would say particularly the private sector at times, the things that we're asked to do that the private sector aren't asked to do, particularly in procurement, um, I would say uh, is, is really challenging um, for us as a sector. But it's, it's, a, it's a question that certainly my board discuss on a regular basis <laughs> and challenges about. So thank you for that. I think it's a really good question. We are in the process of still responding to, to a major incident. Uh, that, that's where we are. We're trying to transition into a new business as, as usual, which is, is really strange to say given the circumstances, but that is where we're trying to get to. Um, we have been quite lucky to get very good political backing um, within the council, which is then been passed on to, to third sectors. I think we're in a similar boat. We chair the group, so at the moment it, it is us. Mm. But as, as we move forward, I think, given what's happening with the COVID inquiry at the moment, we know there'll be an, a, a big inquiry around mm. the, the Ukraine response from Scottish government and UK government. So we are beginning to think about that sort of evaluation assessment, where do we want to get to? I think Paul touched on it. Um, we're still seeing new arrivals every day, and I think that, that that's clear. So there's still that humanitarian safeguarding initial need for, for triage, make people feel safe, and um, get them to a place of safety. However, over the course of the last few months, and 
some of you will be aware of what happened at Council last week about the, the housing um, crisis within Edinburgh. This predominantly is turning into a housing crisis within a housing crisis, especially in the, the east of Scotland and the central belt. Um, we are now looking at longer term housing for people. So we're transitioning away from that just place of safety to actually um, that resettlement moving on next steps. We've been really lucky. We've been backed very well on employability. If we're looking at assessing, assessing employability from Capital City Partnership, yeah. um, th there's monthly reports and through that where we've got 85% of people in employment, which is great. Um, transitioning away from those zero hours employability stats into to more sustainable and trying to get back onto career path. We're working with universities. So I think that that next step for us, I'm, I'm not, given everything, I'm not sure how we evaluate. I've often sat and we've sat as a group to look at what would you define success for this? Now success would be getting everyone home. I think that that's where, where we are. We're a long way from there. So it's now for, for us, one of my main jobs over the, the coming months is, is working with Scottish government as well to look at the, the housing affordability working both through private tenancies, social tenancies, mid-market tenancies. Is there anything we've not thought of that we can do? And it's trying to, to help that move into that sustainable accommodation. Education provision is positive um, as well, which is good. And then I think that wider evaluation piece, it's probably going to be a smaller group um, together with the sort of lead officers from the different partners involved um, pooling, yeah. pooling a piece together. But I think that we're not, we're not quite there. It's ongoing, which we're leading with at the moment. But it'll be interesting to get Paul's views of this because we were laughing about that. But there you go. Yeah, when you asked the question, I actually turned to him and said, are we evaluating? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I think that's a big point. We put a lot of the evaluation of the success of this Ukraine response in the part of the city will actually come through probably much bigger uh, inquiries into what happened. But there is a third sector perspective in here, I would argue, because obviously my, my organization and, and John, my colleague, is in the audience there, who is from our sister organization, EVOC. Uh, we both have funding agreements with Scottish Government who are already who have repeatedly asked us, quite rightly, to um, uh, measure the impact that we are making in those responses. So within the, the wider thing, there will be other, you know, ourselves, EVOC, and other partners like Phoenix and, and Capital City Partnership, all of whom are having to talk to, you know, demonstrate to their funders the evaluation and the effectiveness of what we're doing within the bigger picture. Great. Did that help? Yes, Thanks. it did. Thank you. So there was another question over here somewhere. Uh, well, this this gentleman. Um, so I'm from Plymouth. We're a sort of data sharing and evaluation platform between the third and public sectors. But my question is about sort of with those relationships and those partners, how do you maintain them when the individuals involved move on or sort of change jobs? How does that work and what challenges does that provide? Who wants to go first? I'll just really quickly say that hasn't, ours is still relatively new, so we haven't really had that <laughs> yet. Um, kind of all of the key partners in each um, <coughs> organisation within Fast Track Cities is kind of our, our, our favourite people have stayed. So, or not favourite, <laughs> but our key people have stayed. So, uh, can't add much, I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, it's a fantastic question because I think, you know, we, we started off this discussion about relationships and that a lot of this comes down to, you know, that building of the trust and confidence. Um, and I think there's probably a couple of things in there. One is, you know, when you find your person in an organisation, you know, where you're like, oh my goodness, we, we totally understand each other and we're on the same page. First of all, is to make sure that you broaden that out during the work, mm -hmm. you know, is to make sure you do include other people so that you can create a bit of ballast, you know, there. Um, I think the second thing is to, is to stick with the mission and the values with each organisation or partner, because then if the people change, hopefully that will keep you bound together. Um, certainly from my perspective, the minute I know there's somebody new coming into the mix, it's like, what do I do to make them really want to be involved in this and, and to feel the same way that, that we all feel about it? And that can take time. And it can be like, well, you know, we, we need to build the time and, and give pe that person the time to sort of trust and, and build their own confidence um, with us on that. So I think there's something really there about the, the relationship building. I think, you know, for coming from your, your sort of question there about data sharing and, and I guess there's also something about cultural differences in organisations um, and sort of recognising that, that, you know, that the person who's doing the data sharing 
you know, platform and developing that API or whatever it is they're doing will be quite different to my policy person who might be the person who's been lobbying for the thing to happen. So it's also about finding people and, and recognising that we, they will be different to you. You know, they will have a different approach and a different way of, of looking at things. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this to everybody. Uh, one of the things I did do a, a year or so ago is I took a five-month sabbatical from my own organisation, but as a chief executive, it's a really hard thing to do, um, <laughs> is to step away. Um, and part of it, and I've got two of my team here, so I hope they don't mind me saying this, part of it was you can't have a personality-led partnership or organisation. It mustn't be led by that. It has to be led by the mission. And in stepping away for five months, I really hope they missed me <laughs> and wanted me back. But at the same time, the organisation ran fine. Mm -hmm. And that, to my mind, is if, when I look at partnerships and I think, if somebody moves out of this, is this going to collapse? Because if the answer is yes, it's not a true partnership. Mm -hmm. And then you have to look at what it is that's binding people together on that. So that's, that's kind of my approach to it, is if I took myself out of this, would it still run? And if not, then I need to do some work around that. Yeah, what do you think, Paul? How would you feel if Gavin were to change jobs? Hey, Move no, to I think it's a degree of luck. <laughs> I, I think we have to be honest there. I think it's a degree of luck. My God, that, that's given me hives of fear. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I, I recognise I have control issues. Uh, so <laughs> I do too. <laughs> <laughs> we, we should talk after this. Thing. Okay. Sport Sport Sport. Sport. <laughs> uh, I think there's a degree of luck in it, but I also think there's a degree, I think it comes back to what you said about being led by the mission. If everybody in the team is, and in, in the team, I mean the partnership team, is on the same page then if someone leaves and someone else comes in then actually there's a degree of peer learning um, perhaps modeling you know much in the same way that anybody who manages a team or manages an organization recognizes the need to you know um, actually to model behaviors uh, and, and, and instill a value system. If I drop dead tomorrow my organization will continue of course it will someone else will come in and it'll be different you know and, and that but I think it's really, I think we've been lucky, but also it's about understanding that we are all <coughs> part of the bigger process. Displaced Ukrainians would still alive in the city if Gavin disappeared tomorrow, God forbid. You know, that will happen. We still will need to respond. Any further questions? Oh, one in, right in the middle. Nigel Galea from Simon Community Scotland. Um, can I talk about the F word, um, funding? <laughs> um, we, um, we rely on about 40 different organisations to support people that we support, exp uh, people in Scotland experiencing homelessness. And we couldn't do our jobs without that support across the public, private sector and the third sector. Where we have issues with the, with the, private, with the, with the third sector is, is, is funding, and if those agreements are not set up when funding is first allocated, it's incredibly <coughs> difficult to kind of midstream mid to kind of um, agree a new partnership, and, and funding always seems to get in the way when actually the person that the, that's receiving the, the support is the most important person, but sometimes funding is the overriding barrier, and that's really, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I'd be really interested to hear the panel, um, the panel's um, thoughts. But um, for us, it kind of is a daily kind of slog, and um, you know we believe in collaborate, not compete. But you know sometimes it feels like we are competing. So Anna, you must uh, maybe not in even in this particular partnership, but generally within Waverley Care, you must come across this issue. Absolutely. Um, kind of one of the first issues we had with funding when we began our Fast Track Cities journey is that the international organisations that uh, run the initiative don't provide you any funding once you sign up. You kind of have to slightly fend for yourselves <coughs> a little bit. And that's an issue that we've had with the, cross, the cities across uh, Scotland. You know, some are able to receive funding on certain projects to do with HIV transmission elimination. Um, Others have really great working groups. For example, NHS Tayside have an anti-stigma working group, which Fast Track Cities slots in perfectly with that. But then others don't, and others have a much bigger um, third sector presence in their city, for example, up in Aberdeen. Um, much of the Fast Track Cities work is led by an organization called Our Positive Voice, who have you know, said that you know, they're, they're struggling to live up to the expectations of being a Fast Track City because there isn't much funding, in, obviously, in general. Um, and we've you know, struggled with that because we are feeling the same. Um, but we also can you know, apply for funding from the organisations that run it internationally. Um, but you know, we just have to look for 
relevant pots of funding when they crop up. Um, we also run a, as I said, the community panel, uh, which is a representative of the community, people living with HIV. Um, and that is just so vital to everything that we do in our work. Um, you know, they're just as an equal partner as the NHS is, as uh, the council is. And we are able to pay them. We've managed to come across a pot of funding which allows us to pay them for their work and their time. And I guess these things sometimes just happen by, you know, sheer luck sometimes. You come across the perfect application to apply for that fits in with the exact project you're doing and you're like, great, but that doesn't happen all the time and it is that kind of unpredictable nature which is, is really tricky for us. So, yeah, solidarity, <laughs> you know how it feels, but um, we're working on it. Yeah, yeah, it, solidarity sounds like the word because, Paul, is there a solution to this? <laughs> you know, you work, you work in the local, the local voluntary <laughs> sector. Is there, you know, is there... I'd be making a fortune as a consultant running around, <laughs> yeah. giving that solution to people. Uh, I think, I, it, of course, it's a constant challenge and it is really problematic. I would reflect on our own partnership. Bear in mind, we were responding to a crisis, right? Uh, and that was actually quite important. So in the early days of that crisis, when there's a real humanitarian response needed in the city, Frankly, many of the third sector partners, and actually probably Gavin could speak to this about the council as well, were just going, right, well, that needs doing, so we're doing it, and we'll worry about how we pay for it later. And that definitely went on. And that was okay, initially. I would reflect, we had a heady few months where my, my own organisation and my sister organisation, EVOC, are both like, you know, I certainly got hold over the coals at a one board meeting by my trustees. About, I, I can tell you that about the amount of resource that Volunteer Edinburgh was putting in to uh, this particular project and the strain it was taking on the organisation because it was enormous. In those early days, it was a seven day a week operation. And why was there no dedicated funding for it? Meanwhile, we're having conversations with the Scottish Government about that. But as you know, the wheels turn slowly sometimes. That was extremely problematic. And I'll be honest, I actually got, ironically, it was at the, a gathering, uh, at an event at the gathering, one of the, I think it must have been the last gathering, and I actually said to my Scottish government contact uh, there, I said, you have a week and I withdraw service. Mm -hmm. And that was the reality. And I, I was praying that wasn't going to happen because I knew the need was there. But I am an employee of Volunteer Edinburgh and my board told me to withdraw service. And that was a sweaty time for us, wasn't it? And I, yeah. and I think, <coughs> I think from our side, a slightly different situation, obviously given the, the circumstances. But at the same time, that period of time, there was no clarity over funding from UK government down to Scottish government into local authorities. There still isn't for year two, and we're almost at the end of year two. So what we initially did, and to try and safeguard the support from third sector partners as well was pull together a, a three-year budget, basically, but on year one funding. Um, Edinburgh is in a, a slightly unique position in Scotland, given tariff funding for, for displaced people, so it's £10,500 per person. There is a lot of caveats what you can do with that money, but because Edinburgh has taken 25% of people into the country, our budget is slightly larger than a lot of other local authorities, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Dundee, on similar levels. So I think what, what we sat down with our finance leads and the, the, the partners as well was to look at, right, what can we do to, to make sure we can do this support, not knowing what's coming in years two and three and possibly four and five, we don't know. Um, but let's look at what, what can we allocate for year one to this partnership group, this partnership group, and actually, by doing that, we're in a position now where when we've got proposals coming forward for the next two years, we've actually got allocated funding for that, um, which is good. I know not everyone's been able to do that. It is complete unique circumstances for us. But I hope that has meant that, that there's, the anxiety levels have dropped somewhat um, for that. But <laughs> just for that side. Um, but it's, it's difficult because a lot of the, the initial funding came from Scottish Government and we did have to lobby um, quite hard at times this time last year um, to get that. And as we transition away from a sort of national into a regional response for, for everything else, I think hopefully over the next two years we are in a good place. But that is almost sheer luck and just a bit of forward planning. It's just thinking two steps ahead about what we can do, understanding not everyone can do that, but we're in a unique position. 
However, that has changed somewhat given the housing crisis, and it's now looking at it's us again lobbying the Scottish government and UK government to say yes, you've got your affordable housing program, you've got your long-term Ukraine resettlement fund, which was 50 million for all local authorities. What other pots of money can we do to to put that into the the longer-term affordable housing side? Now, we've managed to to work with a, a couple of builders, house building companies over the last few weeks and we're in a position where we're, we are now submitted proposals into a couple of those funds um, to pull together and that's, as I say, that's my job now. It's, it's almost the other side of things. We, I think we're, we're okay for the time being now for, yeah. for grants giving out and it's now us looking at exactly the same position you guys are in now. How do we access, what funds can we access, is there anything we don't? Is going into the, the private sector again, we, we forged very good links with NatWest, RBS, is there opportunities around that for, for house builders? We're meeting with the CABSEC and Minister for Housing met last week and we're meeting again next week. It's, it's looking at what's not been done. We're in a crisis, which with an extra 30,000 people arriving um, has really put the, the focus on that. So that, that is my job now for the next sort of six months is looking at how I access pots of funding um, to, to look at what else we can do for, from that yeah. affordable housing side of things. So, Jane Clare, how do you get that balance right? How do you make those decisions about um, delivering services to people who need them when there isn't funding available? So that's a, one of the questions that keeps me awake at night, <laughs> I guess. Um, I suppose a, a key challenge is, and certainly I guess in the position of reporting to a board, is that you're, you're often having to make decisions that you would never want to make. And, and the resilience, I think, around leaders in the third sector and, and people who are making those decisions, finance teams putting that up to their chief exec to tell them you can't afford it, <laughs> to taking it to your board. I'm not sure we recognise how much stress that causes. So I think there's a bit of, you know, the, the looking after each other piece, that when you're saying, I've got three services, I can only afford two, how do you make the call? And then how do you live with yourself after it? Because that, that's really challenging, I think. Um, and I'm not sure that there's, there's enough recognition. I, th I don't think we like to recognise it in ourselves because then we have to admit <laughs> that it happens. But also I think from our partners that that is a key issue. Um, one of the things that I do say to, to my government colleagues sometimes is, um, and it, it sounds quite challenging, but is to say to them, you don't actually know what it's like to see a pound come in and a pound come out physically from a bank account. But I do have to think about that because if the money doesn't come in, I physically can't pay people. Their budgets are constrained within the public sector, absolutely, we know that. But they don't necessarily have to make people redundant on an annual basis, or have to think, I need to issue my 12-week letters, or I'm gonna to have to have those conversations with staff to say, I genuinely can't tell you if we're gonna have a job in six months' time, but can you just keep that momentum going and <laughs> keep your motivation going? So it's definitely something, I, if, if I had my way, I'd want every public servant to have a 30-minute introduction to cash in, cash out in the third sector of, of what you have to do when you trigger employment law, you trigger contracts and you trigger those decisions and then, and then what it is you have to do around that. Because I sometimes think that understanding is, is very definitely not there. I think probably on this one, I, I think through hard lessons, that at the start of the pandemic, we were losing half a million pounds a month. And I kind of extrapolated from that that we had six months or we weren't gonna survive as an organization. And it was the hardest thing to sit with a glass of wine and go, what will I do? Um, I had an amazing team around me, I had amazing people sort of advising and, and coming together to create those um, you know, approaches and activities that would bring in the money. But ultimately what I came to was, if this is going to end, it has to end elegantly. We have to end it in a really positive way so that if at some point somebody else can pick it up, that we've left it in that space. And I do wonder whether we ever give ourselves enough time in the third sector to do that bit. H how would we close in an elegant fashion, despite the fact that's the last thing that you ever want to do? And then what training and support and development is there in that? How to close a charity or how to take that forward with a partner and say, can you take it on for us? Or can somebody else have a look at it for us? So that I think one of the ways that I deal with the funding decisions is around taking a very tough approach at the start of a journey, and then anything else that happens is a positive. You know, I, I might need to make people redundant, I might need to cut the service, I might need to explain to people why it is that your aphasia won't get any better because we won't be there. And then to also take that message to, to government and the public sector. And to be honest with you, to, to sometimes show the emotion around that, which we find hard, but I have sometimes said, you know, are, are you gonna go home tonight and worry about that? Because I am, and are you going to worry about it tonight? 
um, and to bring that vulnerability in a little bit, which is, is not easy to do uh, when you're trying to lead an organisation and, and keep people motivated. And, and I, I think that's key as part of the partnership. I think it's understanding that. I think one of the things trying to encourage my team to do is spend time with, their, with the other partners, spend time in the office, spend time getting to know the organisation. Mm -hmm. It works both ways. We're trying to encourage Scottish Government colleagues at the moment to come into our environment work within our team, have those difficult, watch the difficult conversations, understand the impact of some of the, the wider decisions, especially around about mm -hmm. budgets as well. Go to a local office, sit, look at the homeless presentations, actually sit and understand what people are going through. I think that's a hope, again, w with the partnership that we forge with Border Force, the prime example as well, understanding them, understanding us, yeah. you, us understanding them. That, benefits longer it, it's huge longer term benefits because you, you're completely right some people don't understand the value of that pound coming in pound going out mm. they don't see that they just sort of cru cruise control and they don't understand the impacts if we lost volunteer Edinburgh last year the, mm. the impacts to the whole response nationally not just the city mm. would have been catastrophic mm. and actually I don't know how we would have replicated that we, w we couldn't have and that was the conversations we were trying to have with officials yep. to say, you've got to look at this, you've got to understand, I'm coming in from public sector, you're coming in from third sector, but we also had private sector with us as well in that. It's like, you've got to look at the bigger picture there and understand the Im impacts yep. of, of some of that decision making. So I think, again, the partnership work and understanding the other organisations you're working with from top right down to all levels is absolutely crucial and hopefully benefits longer term, I hope. So it sounds like having those honest conversations and, and keeping being, keeping, uh, explaining to your partners the situation is key to this. Um, do we have, so do we have any further questions right down at the front here? Hi, uh, just returning to evaluation, um, I wanted to ask, um, you know, you talked a lot about the demands of funders, um, wanting evaluation for accountability. Yeah. Um, my question is, what would evaluation look like for the partnership if um, you could design your own evaluation to gather learning and improvement without funders demanding any kind of specific evaluation? Interesting. Um, I've realised we've only got about a couple of minutes left as well. So that's a. Uh, so should we have one answer to that? Who who de who's keen? Paul. Pragmatism, right? <laughs> so I'll do what I need to do for the Scottish government, and you know, and the great thing is stuff. Actually, the only evaluation, the only metric that matters, are the people who arrived here in Edinburgh safe, mm -hmm. secure, housed with opportunities to go in employment and are their kids in education and be looked after. Anything else, I'm really not interested in. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good point to end on. I, do, I am going to ask you to, uh, to conclude again <laughs> with just some, maybe some final top tips, maybe a top tip from each one of you on um, developing and maintaining a partnership so that it's, uh, it continues to work for um, your mission. Anna. Sure. I think... I would say it's so important to identify the short term wins. Um, for us, you know, the, the goal of the initiative is to get to zero new HIV transmissions by 2030. And you say that to people and they're like, what? Like, that is like a huge goal. So I think it's all the steps towards getting there is what is really encouraging to partners um, and having, you know, a really successful event. So we hosted a community event in Glasgow with people living with HIV, getting their priorities and what the changes they want to see, the issues they want um, Fast Track City to focus on. And then for the, the members of the partnership in Glasgow to hear that from the community was just really motivating and really inspiring. And I think, yeah, m making sure that you are able to see obviously the, the goal way in the end, but kind of all the other steps you're going to get take to get there and, and those shorter term wins. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I think the first thing is that after the excitement of your partnership launch mm. is make sure your governance is in place, make sure your processes are in place, make sure you've got a project plan in place, all the stuff that sounds maybe the duller side of things, but actually that's what's going to make your partnership work and help you if things go a bit um, awry. I would also say that when you do get a win, celebrate it. Mm -hmm. We're not always very good at celebrating. We, we worry about all the things that go wrong. We're not always really good at going, God, that was a really good job. We really did well there. You know, let's tell lots of people about it. 
the minute something does start to go wrong, talk about it. Like, just don't sit on it. And I've done that. I've sat there going, ah, I'm a bit annoyed about that, but I'll let it roll a couple of months and see if it gets better. And it never does. <laughs> it just gets worse for you, um, I think, in that. And then bring the cookies. So, uh, you know, we talk about never underestimate the power of a cup of tea in the charity. Genuinely, most problems could be solved if you say, do you want to go for a coffee or a cuppa and work this out? So that relationship piece, I think, is really important. I think you still, you still want to buy that, sorry. No, no, I think it's building on that. I think it is. It's ce celebrate, celebrate when good things go well, but actually understanding and being honest and open when they don't go well. And I think that, that conversation, the open, honest conversation within your partnership is absolutely required to, to, to build on. So I think it is, yes, celebrate, but actually speak about when it doesn't. Speak openly, speak honestly. And that actually builds trust. And I think our one's built on trust. And that, that would be my key takeaway. Yeah, trust, trust is the answer. It really is. Mm -hmm. And also understanding and respecting each other's limitations, mm -hmm. you know? And not be afraid of that. If there's something you can't do, there are <coughs> things that I can do, the third sector can do way faster than Gavin. And there are lots of stuff that we can't do because it's not our remit and our role. Understand that, work with each other, find the solutions. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We could have talked about this for much longer because in the sessions when we've pre prepped for this uh, panel, we've talked about lots of different issues that we haven't even touched on today. Um, I'm sure if any of you want to speak to any of the panellists, feel free to come down and have a word now. But thank you very much to the panellists and to all of, all of you.